Our second reading this morning comes from the Epistle of James, chapter 3, verses 1. We're going to go 1 through 12. I know I put 1 through 16 in the bulletin, but I thought 12 had enough information for us. So let us continue to hear from God's word. James is writing, he says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will face a stricter judgment. For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is mature, able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. If we put bits in the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships. They are so large and are driven by strong winds, yet they are guided by a very small rudder whenever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is fire. The tongue is a place among our members as a world of iniquity. It can stain the whole body, set the, uh, on fire a cycle of life, and it itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird and reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species, but no one can tame the tongue, a relentless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord, and with it we curse people made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth will come a blessing and a curse. My brothers and sisters, this ought not be so. Does a spring pour forth the same open, from the same opening both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives on, on grapevine fig or grapevine on a grapevine fig? No more than salt water can yield fresh. We have heard two times from the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When you hear the word performance review, what do you think of? Does it make you smile? <laughs> I would suspect it doesn't. It's not something you, that you would look forward to. None of us tends to like getting performance reviews. No matter how many good things a supervisor or a boss might say to us, we tend to remember something different, don't we? We tend to read over it, over and over, if it's, on the, if it's printed out. Are they the accolades? Are they the accomplishments listed? No, what we remember are the criticisms, the criticisms that are labeled at, leveled at us. We remember what is said, particularly if we feel it is wrong and incorrect. Words matter. In the military, you would often get an annual performance review. Supervisors usually had so many of them to do that they would actually ask you to provide input for your own rating. And usually, if what you offered to them was accurate, they would include it. But you were always wondering, what were they going to include? What were they going to leave out? What were they going to add in, maybe, that you hadn't put in there? Was the praise going to be faint? Was it going to be generic, or was it going to be genuine? How would they rank you according to your peers? What would they recommend you for next? It was usually, you know, you would work on all this and then it would go up and down in the chain of command and they would change it all and they would, it would finally go formal and it would go in your personnel file and every year, everybody would go and check and see what their final performance review that was permanently in their records would say with a little more than anxiety as they read it. Words about you can have lasting impact. In our passage today, though, James' brother warns us of an upcoming performance review that everybody is going to face, not for a job or even for a year of our lives, but for our whole life, our entire lives. We are all going to be reviewed, and it's going to be done by none other than God. And, and, and 
James says, this, as this will be done by God, we should keep in mind who we are. Holding that image in, in your mind, James turns to one specific area that he assures us is going to come up in the life review when we stand before God, and that's how we use our mouths. That's how we speak, and that's what we'll focus in on today. Welcome to my second to last sermon here at Westminster Presbyterian, where we are continuing to work through James's letter. And I will confess to you from the beginning that this is a challenging topic to preach on, and it's not because it's controversial. Everyone will say, yeah, yeah, you know, what James is saying is true. But then, if we think we've already gotten to the end of the matter, our minds can start to wonder, what's for lunch? How's that football game going to go? Whatever it is. And should they wander? When James says that one day, this is going to be an important topic as we stand before our maker. Shouldn't that be a very relevant and very interesting topic to us? James, throughout his letter, is trying to give us practical advice. And today's advice is on what tends to get us all in more than a bit of trouble. He equates what we say with the equivalent of being able to start a fire, and a fire that can get out of control. James does this in his opening chapter, it opens this chapter, I should say, by warning us that not only does it matter, but that God is going to remember what we say throughout our lives and make us face it. And the standards of what we say will become particularly relevant for teachers, for that is their job. And by that he means teachers of the faith. So he reasons not everybody should be one. Now does James have clergy in mind or what the equivalent was in his day? Yes, absolutely, most assuredly he does. I absolutely believe some folks in this life who are given spiritual authority and misuse it are going to be particularly called to account before the Lord. Or who were who or who, who is the person who comes up and, and says just the right thing in the pulpit or in the Bible study, wherever they're teaching the faith, and then goes out and lives a very different life? I think God's going to call them to account for that too. Does this mean that God cares about the content of sermons and of Bible studies? Yes, I absolutely believe God most certainly does. But what are the folk, what are those folks? Who are those folks being? What are they saying when they're outside of the classroom, when they're away from the pulpit? I think that's what James is really calling into question. I also think God watches and sees those of us who share our faith, which we are all called to do, use their mouths when they're out in public, when they're in their families. James's brother, Jesus, had more than a little to say about hypocrisy in the religious institutions in his day, James warns us that the same is going to apply in any day. God particularly, James's words particularly, should be of note for pastors and elders and deacons all responsible for sharing the faith. I always wonder if we should include this passage on ordination Sundays. I think we should. And it applies not only in misleading people with our words, but I think it applies in not taking the time to think through if people understand what is being taught. A story. My grandfather's father was a foreman at a sawmill in South Louisiana at the turn of the 20th century. So when my son was little, we told him about his great-grandfather. We told him about how he was so strong because his job was to pound the blades flat any time that there was a kink or a, a, a bubble in any of the blades he was there to pound them flat and the result of which he had tremendous forearms and so i told him kind of as an aside you know your great grandfather had forearms like popeye and then i didn't think any more of it 
But what I wasn't thinking at the time is that John, my son, had never seen the cartoon character Popeye <laughs> and had no idea. But he did watch this cartoon called Ben 10. And in Ben 10, there was a character who had four arms. Four. <laughs> And so he was sitting there trying to imagine his great-grandfather with four arms working in the sawmill. And so I'm sure you have stories like that from your own families. But I think it's important to think about misunderstandings that can come in church from people not thinking through, not understanding the passage that are coming from, that are coming to them from ministers who've been in seminary for three years and studied Greek and Hebrew and the like people who haven't had the time to dig into the Bible, and the number of symbolic things in the Bible that have been represented in pulpits in our country as being literal, which absolutely misconstrues what is being said there, is scary. The number of times words of the Bible have been manipulated for the own ends of the person preaching or the organization is a huge problem. And then there are flat out misunderstandings that people have. Words matter. The way we use words matter, particularly when we're passing on the faith. Why do we think God doesn't think this is a big issue for the church? James continues his discussion by taking two common things in, his, in, in their lives, a horse's bit and a ship's rudder. And he makes the point that on both of these, these very small instruments can change the course of, of an animal and of a ship that has great power. And this is what James equates our tongues with. Here too, James equates the tongue in this instance is the driver of the person by what we are saying. What we say matters. We all tend to remember that thing from childhood, that rhyme that we learn, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. But as adults, we know that's far from the truth. As a look, look back, it's almost the opposite. We can heal up physically from almost any wound that we have. Wounds can be bandaged over, broken bones can be splinted, but words, words last. How many of you have talked to somebody? How many of you yourself know in your own life can think of grievances and problems that people have said about you that are decades and decades old, long past any time any wound, physical wound would be there? None of us, none of us wants harsh words thrown in our direction, but we particularly do not want untrue and unjust words said about us. Now, this isn't to say that we are always just supposed to be sweet and nice in everything that we say. Indeed, sometimes some folks need some harsh words. But the question is, what is the intent of those words being offered? The prophets do not lack for harsh words in the Bible. Jesus didn't lack for hard words sometimes in the Bible. We had an entire great Bible study on hard words of Jesus uh, that Don brought us as, as we remembered. But, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, one of the most powerful stories in all the Bible to me is when Nathan goes into King David and he says, oh, King, he says, you know, we've had something happen in our community. We've had, we have this poor man and this poor man has this little lamb and this rich guy who lives nearby took his lamb, his beloved lamb, killed it and ate it. And David is incensed, and he says, who is the man guilty of this great crime? And you remember, Nathan points to him and says, you, you are that man. But Nathan wasn't doing that to be mean or to belittle David. He was getting, telling David that to realize the evil that he had done so that he could repent. Intent is always the key behind the words that we offer. And today I think we need to expand a bit on words to think about more than our verbal speech. Do you think God is pleased with us when we go to church and we sing wonderful hymns and we preach sermons and we do great things and then we go online 
and we don't really reflect that in the words that we write down online? Do you think Christians have been harsh and foul sometimes on social media? Is that who we are called to be? As I've shared with you before, I'm reading a book by, called Fireweather by John Valiant. And John Valiant tells the story from this previous decade of this massive fire that happened up at Fort McMurray, Canada. And he writes that the fire started up there when it was just dry and hot one summer day and lightning hit. And this happens all the time up there. But the conditions were just wrong that the fire just grew and grew and they couldn't stop it. And it's kept going. And the, I'm at the point where the fire is actually surrounding the city and getting into the neighborhoods and they're trying to fight it. And it's, ex and it's an exciting read. The fire is so big at this stage, it is creating its own weather patterns. And it will burn down a house in three minutes from being perfectly standing there to three minutes later, there being nothing but the foundation and the nails are the only thing that's left. Three minutes and they're having to fight this fire. James must have seen some kind of ancient large fire because he evokes that imagery when he's making his point. He says the faith community using the wrong words can start a fire and the fire will spread like the fires of Gehenna. Now Gehenna was the perpetually burning garbage dump outside of Jerusalem, which we translate as the word hell. And I think even in my own lifetime, I have seen words offered in churches and in Christian newspapers, newsletters, which have started fires. I mean, fires between people. It's led to church schisms. It's led to church closings. It's, it's greatly reduced donations to churches. All the words being offered, written down or spoken. I can tell you when I believe that we should speak the most with kindness and with care, kind of like a boat when it's approaching the rapids or you're on that horse and you're controlling it with the bit on a narrow path. It's words that we ascribe to whole groups of people. Who are we to judge the motivations of large groups? Who, do we, who are we who think we have the expertise to do that? We start talking about people in this group or in that group, and we are lighting a fire that is very combustible. I think we've seen some of that in the news this week. James reaches a, the peak in this part of his letter by pointing out that our tongues have the potential to be a restless evil full of deadly poison. Consider, James wrote, how we in the church speak both inside and outside of it. Can we really bless God with our mouths in one moment and then turn around and curse people in the next? Do the blessings we offer God mean anything if two hours later we're cursing somebody on the, on the highway or something else? This behavior James compares to trying to gather olives and figs from the same tree or brackish and, and fresh water from the same pond. James here invites consideration of how we speak to one another as God's people in the church as well as beyond the church. What kind of output are our mouths producing? People, all people, James reminds us, all, everybody out there is made in the image of God. How can we be so comfortable cursing people made in the image of God? And that certainly includes people of different ethnic groups, legal statuses, nationalities, political stances, and a host of other labels that we put on people that we think, okay, well now it's okay to cut them down. James also invites us to consider the importance of silence. Silence not in the face of evil, but using silence rather as a means to make sure we are not saying the wrong thing. Maybe saying nothing in some situations is the best thing we can do of all. So does that mean that grace has gone away? That we're all now just going to be sitting here with this scorecard again? 
that we've always, you know, taught that that's not the case, that we are saved by grace, so God's not, has this big checklist against us? Does that mean we're going to be thrown into hell if we're not living up to the words that we offer in church? I very much am not saying that. I believe grace is still in play. And it means that in the end, when we are judged, that grace is the final factor. But that doesn't mean that God isn't going to make us face up, face up to who we have been, the way we have lived, and the words we have used as his people. So does this mean that if we're not teachers or preachers, that we are free to say whatever we want to? I don't think so. I think all Christians are called to share the good news in their families, in their neighborhoods, and beyond, which makes us all teachers in a way. I do, I do think that jo those of us who are ministers and teachers of the faith, just as James wrote, will be called more to account by God, particularly if we're using our words to tear other people down. But I think God calls on all of us to use our voices with grace and with truth. We live in a day when our words can travel faster and further and longer than ever before. The words that we offer, particularly in public, won't be as quickly forgotten as they were in the past. On some of my groups that I'm in online, some of my friends will post, aren't you glad we did the dumb stuff we did before social media existed? You know, I, have to, I, I, could, I could check that one off. But, but today, today the words that we offer never really go away. You may, we may think that we can delete it, but nothing is ever really deleted. They're mirroring the online all the time and taking, it, taking snapshots of it. I think more than any generation that has ever lived, our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren are going to go back, be able to go back and see how we lived our lives and what words we offered and what difference we tried to make in the time that God gave us. And beyond modern technology, no matter if we threw all the cell phones and the computers away, God has and always is with us, and God remembers the way we use our words. And we know what God expects of us. So what if we, so what if we think back now and go, uh-oh, <laughs> you know, I haven't really done this too well. I know that there are things that I have said that I shouldn't have said. I know there are things I've written that I shouldn't have written. I know there are words that I've offered that have been less than kind to help build people up or use my words to cover something up, whatever it may be. And so what do we do now? And I know as a minister, I'm one of those ones who's going to have the stricter performance review. What I can say is that the past can't be undone. We can't change what has happened. But I do think that God takes note of when we try to do better and when we try to grow. None of us are perfect. James even says so in this passage. But I think that God expects more and more of us to work on improving who we have been throughout our lives. I think God expects us, more of us, and always wants us to work on improving together. You know, we can sit back and look at the church, for example, and say, look at this that the church did, look at that that the church did. Oh my gosh, how did the church stand for that? How did the, how did the church divide people like that? But can't we sit back today and say, our brothers and sisters in the past might not have gotten that right. We are trying to do it differently. We are trying to speak God's word, be God's people with more authenticity. We can't ever change the past, but we have great capabilities to change right now and who we're going to be tomorrow. And maybe today is the very day that we should ask for God's help in using our, using our rudders, using those bits a little bit more effectively to use James's metaphors. Let us remember that words indeed matter, and they matter to God and to God's people. 
May we be a people who share the love of God, not just in God's house, but well beyond. May our words be gracious. May our words be just. May our words be true. Let us start no fires between people. And may the words that we offer, if anything, share the fountain of life instead. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen.